Um, I'll make the parish announcements first, as I usually do. Um, to be honest, there aren't really very many to make, because you should all now have had, in the last week or so, the latest issue of the magazine, and there's not really much I can add uh, to what's in there, and I won't go through um, all the events that are listed. Um, there is, however, one omission, and I have castigated the editor of the magazine <laughs> on the website. Um, we didn't publish the date uh, of the uh, Acton Depot open weekend in April. Uh, and let's make sure that I get it right. Uh, it's Saturday the 22nd and Sunday the 23rd of April. That will be the Acton Depot open weekend. We'll confirm that in an email to you, those who are on the email list, um, probably in the next week or so, to do one or two other things. Uh, we want to pursue, including the membership survey, and we'll wrap those up in an email. Um, but that's the date for the Depot Open Weekend. This one is the one where friends get concessionary entry uh, at £6, I think it's going to be this year. Uh, so if you want to book in advance for that, you'll be able to do that on the, on the museum website so that you don't have to join the, the ticket queue. Um, the other thing I was going to mention uh, is that in setting out as we did in the magazine, uh, the arrangements we've now got for reserving seats and so on. Um, one or two people have asked when it is normally that we open the bookings for each meeting. Um, and having broadly now got into a routine for, for doing the bookings process, uh, what we're going to do is aim as each meeting is held, so tonight's tonight, uh, on the following day, we would hope that the criticise us too much if we're a little a day, a day late, um, but, but once this meeting is finished, then the next one will become bookable. So you should be able to book for the next meeting, uh, which is um, Roger French, uh, known to many of you formerly as the managing director of one of the award-winning bus companies, Brighton and Hove, uh, but now uh, enjoying his retirement and seemingly from his writings in various magazines travelling the country uh, to see both good and bad practice in uh, transport and particularly transport publicity uh, and he is going to identify um, probably from those recent journeys 10 ways to increase bus and train passenger numbers uh, so that's Roger on the 27th of February uh, all the visits which we've announced in the magazine as we speak tonight are still open for bookings um, we've slightly changed the administrative arrangements for those the long distance ones like the sleeper trips to Cornwall that some of us have been going on over the last month or so uh, and the, the, the uh, horse drawn barge one in here which are organised by Mike Kay, you book directly with him at the address that's shown in the magazine the shorter ones um, of which this time's examples are the fire fire exhibition and the visit to St Paul's Cathedral that precedes that uh, and the programme of London Walks, which is an interesting thing we thought we would develop in conjunction with Paul Surma here at the museum. All of those have normally been booked up to now through Susan Gilbert, uh, who has quite enough to do. So um, we uh, very quickly accepted an offer um, from John Cakey's good lady, Helen, uh, that she will now administer those arrangements <coughs> for what we call our domestic friends visits, the shorter distance ones. Uh, so you shouldn't have to trouble Susan for anything to do with visits. You either get in touch with Mike Kay for the long distance ones, uh, or you make your booking for the shorter ones with Ben Pick. Um, but as far as I know, um, there are places available on all the, all the visits uh, which we advertise in the magazine. And that's <coughs> the end of the parish notices, I think. Um, so sorry, sorry, does that include the tram link to which is... No, that one where we said in the magazine is fully booked, uh, is fully booked, um, I, I'm only in the relative recent past, but I'm afraid that all that is now, because Tramlink were very keen that we only sold as many tickets as there were seats on the tram, we had standing passengers yeah. on earlier ones, and they decided that's not a sensible thing to do. So, uh, sorry, that one uh, is full, but I think that's the fifth one, or even the sixth one, so I suspect there'll be, I suspect there'll be more. Uh, okay, so we go to tonight. Um, we're used in transport to long-running sagas, and I guess the saga of London's third airport uh, is one of the longest-running ones. It may be approaching a final decision, it may not, who knows. Uh, Paul's looking doubtful. 
Um, but that's broadly um, the area we're going to explore tonight. Uh, it's clearly a very topical one. Um, I first got to know Paul as we were reminiscing just now when uh, he was working for Heathrow Airport and I was working for London Transport. And we used occasionally to meet at meetings where Paul was explaining what the airport was up to with its customers. And I used to go along to explain what London Transport was doing to its customers in the services provided to get them to and from the airport. Um, but Paul's had a much broader um, career, both in airport management uh, and in aviation and uh, related matters generally, with a particular interest, would it be fair to say, in access arrangements um, between the airport and, and the city that it's, uh, it serves. So who better? Paul is now an aviation and transport consultant, uh, but reflecting all the doubts about where we are, where we may go, there's the title of the talk, Indecision, Decision and Counter Decision, the History of Airports Policy. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Nice to see a good audience. Can I just check the, the sound? You can hear all right, can you? Good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so that's the title. Um, so let's get straight on. Uh, basically, two parts to this presentation. The first part, I'm going to go through a sort of fairly typical history timeline, literally going uh, over the years. Uh, and then the second part, I'm going to try and pick out these six uh, themes of, of what's gone on over, over this timeline. So there's a little bit of repetition, but I'm trying to sort of look at it from two different perspectives. And hopefully we'll have time for some, for some questions. Uh, just a bit about me. Um, as, uh, as Barry said, I had 30 years with BAA, as it was, uh, and then I had a short time with Eurostar and some consultancy. Uh, various other bits there. This particular project started as a, as a PhD in, in my retirement, uh, but I, I'm, I'm no longer doing it uh, uh, through Loughborough University. I'm doing it independently, and the intention at the end of the day is to write a book. Uh, so, if there's any publishers here who know who are interested in you know, I'm talking. Um, uh, basically, my research starts in the mid 70s because there's a particular event there and it goes back about 40 years, and that's about the time I was uh, first involved. But here's a little bit of pre history, pre 74 uh, history, just to, to, to get the context. Uh, this is um, uh, the Heathrow area pre Second World War, and there is a little airfield uh, somewhere here, if I can pick it out, uh, the Ferry. Uh, ferry uh, airfield in, uh, in, in the Heathrow area. Uh, just a few fields, of course, the, the Heathrow today is much larger. Uh, this was Gatwick in the 30s, which was quite a, a well-established. These are basically private uh, 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 airfields. Uh, there was nothing public at the time. Um, but the Second World War, of course, brought uh, massive expansion of airfields for the RAF, and indeed this one uh, is Stansted, uh, which uh, was eventually used by the US Air Force. Um, so there's a, a very massive expansion of, of airfields at that sort of time. And then we get to the 40s after the, <coughs> after the war, and that was the time when Heathrow opened with this uh, rather, uh, I'm sure these photographs are very familiar, you've seen them lots of times. I haven't really covered this history at all, but there is there are some, some very good uh, stories and uh, history books written about, about the opening of Heathrow, and indeed Gatwick and, and, and other airports. And if you are interested in this sort of period of history, I can, I can certainly recommend uh, one or two there. Um, so we get to the 50s, and Heathrow uh, gets some more permanent buildings in the central area, the Queen's Building and the old Terminal 2, now <coughs> demolished, fairly recently demolished, but they were there from 55, 1955. And this is Gatwick in 1958, when its new terminal and uh, runway uh, uh, Hard the runway and indeed the new railway station opened altogether, 1958 that was. So that takes us through the 50s uh, and then we get to the 60s. Um, <coughs> and Stansted had, had uh, always been held as the, as the potential third airport uh, after its use um, in the Second World War. Um, and in the early 60s there was a, a, a civil service interdepartmental committee that said yes, okay, let's start developing it. It went to public inquiry in Chelmsford in 65-66, and the civil servants uh, who presented evidence were, frankly, useless <laughs> uh, and, and didn't do a very good case, so the inspector recommended against the development. Uh, but the government uh, decided it was going to ignore the inspector's recommendation, so it tried to go ahead with the development, and then it got defeated in Parliament. Uh, this is the, one of the themes that keeps coming up time and time again. So... Um, 
uh, having been defeated in Parliament, uh, it, the, the government then decided, well, look, let's start it afresh. Let's have a look at this whole, whole thing from afresh. <coughs> so it established a royal commission under a, a judge, Roskill, in, um, that, that sat through the six, uh, late 60s and early 70s. And that was, uh, that was very much an independent commission. It had its own research team. It, uh, it took uh, evidence and had local hearings. And a couple of interesting things, I think. Uh, first of all, um, it was one of the first, uh, I'm sorry, not too far, one of the first um, uh, big studies to look at cost-benefit analysis. The first one had been the Victoria Line in the, in the 60s. And they used the same techniques to try and examine the, uh, uh, the pros and cons of, of the various options. Um, the, 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 the whole of the commission recommended that there should be a new airport built by 1980 with uh, at least three or possibly even four runways. So a major new airport should, should be built, and it would indeed eventually replace uh, Heathrow and, uh, and possibly Gatwick. Um, and the majority of the commission recommended that the site should be at Cublington in Buckinghamshire, which is quite near where Milton Keynes is now, close to the West Coast Main Line and the M1. Um, not far from where I live, and, and lovely countryside. <laughs> uh, but that's where they recommended it should be. Um, but they, there was a minority recommendation from Colin Buchanan, uh, and uh, he was a, a famous planner, and his recommendation was that he agreed with the need for a new airport, but he said it should be in the Thames Estuary at Foulnets, which is where uh, this, this plan is here. Uh, later renamed Maplin, but Foulnets is off the uh, Essex coast of the Thames Estuary. Um, and indeed it would be a combined airport, seaport, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, that was what the Roskill uh, Commission uh, uh, um, recommended, and indeed the minority report recommended it, and the government decided to go uh, along with the minority report, and in 1971 set up the Maplin Development uh, Corporation uh, to, to take the, uh, the whole project forward. So that takes us to the mid-70s, which is where I really start my, my, my more detailed research. And uh, it was uh, under a Conservative government, you, uh, under Ted Heath, remember him? He was the chap who took us into the common market, as he was then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but by around mid-70s, mid it was quite clear that, that things were going wrong. And indeed, uh, not, not just wrong on, in terms of Matley, but wrong for him, because he got booted out in a general election and replaced by Harold Wilson. Um, and there was a, a review of, of the whole Matley project in, 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 the mid, in 1974. And effectively, it recommended cancellation, which is what happened. Uh, because of the oil crisis at the time, that there was a dramatic downturn in, in uh, air traffic, um, and uh, the, the whole economy had gone uh, kaput, and there was massive inflation, etc. I'm sure you all remember that time quite well. There's a couple of interesting things that come out of the research in terms of the comments made during this period about, about the, the Roscoe Commission. Uh, Peter Hall, the great uh, uh, geographer and planner, I'm sure many of you know, uh, he wrote a book called Great Planning Disasters, and uh, uh, Foulness and Maplin was one of the chapters, so <laughs> you can see, see what he thought of it. Uh, Peter Self, another famous geographer, he, uh, he had comments about the uh, cost-benefit analysis, which he described as nonsense on stilts. <laughs> I think he stole that from somewhere else, but he clearly didn't think that cost-benefit analysis was, was appropriate. On the other hand, Alan Walters, who you may know, famous economist, uh, he was very critical of Buchanan's uh, minority report, and he said it's uh, words like uh, it had passages of purple prose but no quantification. So he was an economist who felt that you should quantify things like this, and whereas uh, Buchanan had, didn't have any quantification, it was all uh, uh, written. <coughs> so there were interesting comments about uh, uh, about the, the various bits of the commission. And the Treasury was interesting. Uh, remember that at this time, everything's in the public sector. So airports, airlines, uh, uh, and in, you know, virtually all transport's in the, in the public sector. And uh, the Treasury has got to pay for all this stuff uh, from public expenditure. And at the time, there were other big projects, the Channel Tunnel, TSR2, and this, which were all going to have to come out of public funds. And the Treasury was clearly not very keen on that. They didn't actually do very much in, in, in the Commission itself. But they sat back and there's some very interesting, I, I looked at some treasury files at the National Archives, there's some very interesting comments from the civil servants about sitting back and, and letting things play out. And of course, in the end, they played out exactly as they wanted, which was that the whole things were cancelled. 
So uh, that, that's uh, an interesting part there. So we get to cancellation, and what happens is the government says, OK, let's, let's uh, think again. And it sets up a consultation, 75, 76, uh, looking at the whole country. So it was for Great Britain. And from that, uh, it, it came up with a white paper in 78 called Airports Policy, uh, which looked at the uh, short term and, and said, in the short term, we need more terminal capacity at Heathrow and at Gatwick. So Terminal 4 and Terminal 2, or second terminal at Gatwick, were proposed. Um, it also said there should be a, a national airport system, so uh, airports got categorised A, B, C and D. It looked at the whole issue of diverting, trying to divert traffic away from the southeast to, to the regions. That's a constant theme that keeps coming up. And in the long term, it said basically uh, nothing more at Heathrow or Gatwick beyond the, these two proposals. But uh, the options for, sta for, for longer term would be either Stansted, uh, a military, an existing military airfield, or, or you need a new site. So it didn't, it didn't um, specify precisely what should be the long term, but they said those are the options. Just a couple of other things from the 70s. You remember petrol rationing? <laughs> that was a, a, and, and of course, in the meantime, the Piccadilly line gets to Heathrow, 77. Yeah. Well, 76 to Hatton Cross, but 77 to the central area. And that was just in time because Heathrow's roads were really jam packed and had uh, caused some problems, though. so it just arrived at the right time. So, uh, late 70s, 79, uh, uh, this is an interesting time, of course. This was the, the winter of discontent, number one to remember. Uh, and in, in May 79, uh, the, the Labour government gets booted out, and uh, this lady appears uh, as our Prime Minister. Uh, what had happened in the meantime was that after the 78 White Paper, two committees were set up called ACAP and SUGSI, Advisory Committee on Airports Policy, Study Group on Southeast Airports. And they again had another go at this, looking at all the, these issues. Again, the regional diversion issue came up. And for the long term, uh, they, they said, well, look, th these are, we had a great long list, but the short list was these six, six places. Hoggiston is the same as Covington, so that was Buckinghamshire. Uh, Stansted is on that, and Mapton, of course, is the Thames Estuary side. So they came up with those six options, but they didn't attempt to... Um, recommend any particular one. They, they just uh, said, here's, here's the pros and cons of each. And what they did was to let the government, the politicians, decide. And, and the politicians did decide, indeed, on the, on the 17th of December, 79, and they confirmed Heathrow Terminal 4, which by that time had been to a public inquiry, confirmed Gatwick North Terminal, which was just about to go to a public inquiry, and then for the longer term confirmed that Stansted should be the, the, the third airport. So the Maplin site was rejected. Um, and incidentally, at that time, uh, BAA and West Sussex County Council came to an agreement uh, not to build a second <coughs> runway for 40 years. And that, that's quite a significant one, I think. Um, what I think is interesting about this is, is that uh, all, all this stuff had been going on throughout a <coughs> Labour government, but then we have a, a change of government to a quite, you know, radically quite different government uh, in May 79. But the same stuff follows through. It, it, it's the same policies, or at least the policies are being developed. And that's an interesting example of where a change of government has not changed the policy. There are other examples of the other way around. Uh, incidentally, the title of this talk um, comes from a quote from John Knott, who on the 17th of December, 79, he was Secretary of State for Trade, and he said in the House of Commons that years of indecision, decision, and counter decision reflect no credit on this country's ability to make difficult but necessary choices. So that's the full quote. <laughs> OK, um, early 80s. Uh, the Stansted proposal goes to the public inquiry, 81 to 83, under an Inspector Graham Eyre. Um, as well as BAA's application for uh, expansion of Stansted, which is basically a new terminal on the existing runway, uh, uh, a proposal for T5, Heathrow T5, comes forward. Now, remember it had been ruled out in the 78 white paper, but nevertheless, a, a, a planning application was made by Uttlesford District Council. Uttlesford District Council is the council for Stansted, further on. <laughs> Supported by British Airways, <laughs> uh, and indeed, no doubt, some other uh, people as well. But that meant that the application was formally heard by that inquiry. Also, the Town and Country Planning Association put in an application for Mapton. Again, it had been ruled out in 78, but, but they put an application in. They subsequently withdrew it because it didn't actually get very much support, but, but nevertheless, it was formally heard. 
And another group called the North of England Regional Consortium, or NOERC, uh, put in a, uh, not a, a planning application, but a, a proposal, a, 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 a strategy for regional diversion. Again, that had come up previously. So that was heard in 81-83. And um, the decisions were announced in a white paper in 1985. And basically it approved Stansted, uh, approved the expansion on the existing runway, but critically said no more than one runway. The, 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 uh, if you go back to Sugsley, the proposal there had been for a two-runway airport. So they said, yes, OK, uh, uh, Stansted with one runway. They actually um, <coughs> rejected the <coughs> application for Terminal 5 at Heathrow, the particular application, but, and critically but, they recommended particular studies of how the site might be made available. It was previously or then um, occupied by uh, Thames Water Sludge Treatment Works. And also studies of rail access to Heathrow. We'll come on to that a bit later. So although they rejected the particular application, they said, well, there is a possibility that T5 might come back, and, and here's some studies you need to do to, to sort of get them out of the way. Very important, that. They did have a, uh, the, the, the white paper did, however, reject the Maplin and the Noah cases, um, although <laughs> Maplin keeps coming back. <laughs> um, and almost coincidentally, uh, this white paper, where the first part of it was about airport development and, and, and where it should be, but, but the second part of it was about privatisation, because, of course, this was the, the time when lots of nationalised industries were being privatised, and, and one of those was BAA and ND British Airways. What else was going on? Well, of course, the Falklands War, it was 82, wasn't it? And uh, sometime around then, the first um, aircraft were, were being tested onto what became London City Airport, into the old uh, docks down there. Um, late 80s. OK, well, well, we've now got approval, uh, full approvals, to three terminal developments. Heathrow Terminal 4, and this is... Uh, Prince Charles and, and Diana opening Terminal 4. He was rather rude about it. He was rather rude about a lot of buildings. Isn't he? But, uh, uh, he was rather rude. Um, and then there's other things like the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Big Bang. So, so lots going on in the late 80s. And three new terminals developing. So, so a period of, of, of expansion. And the privatizations, as I said, BAA and, and British Airways about the same time. And uh, coincidentally, I'll say a bit more. Um, the Heathrow Express Railway, which had come out of the studies which the 85 white paper had um, uh, suggested, uh, became a, an Act of Parliament that went through the Parliament in uh, 88, uh, 19, sorry, 88 to 91. Uh, 90s. That was an interesting period in the 90s because in some ways this was a period of policy vacuum. Um, although we'd had an 85 <coughs> airports policy white paper, uh, it wasn't very clear what, what the policy was, and certainly wasn't clear for, as far as a long-term runway. Uh, so this study, Rukatsi, began. Runway capacity to serve the southeast, Rukatsi. And that came up with an idea that, that uh, we should be looking towards somewhere around 2010. So some way off before we needed a new runway. But it did the same sort of thing. It, it looked at the possibility of regional diversion. It looked at all the sites that might be available. But to be honest, it was not really very conclusive, and it didn't really lead anywhere. There were, there were parliamentary <coughs> debates and, and various other things like that, but, but it didn't really get anywhere, so it was inconclusive. And there's a, there's a bit of a vacuum. Now, uh, at around that time, the Terminal 5 inquiry, he froze started. Now, remember back, 85 Airports Policy White Paper says, do some studies, but nothing really had, had come from that, except that those studies had reported. <clears throat> so by the time a planning application goes in from BAA for, for, for uh, Terminal 5, it's all a bit unclear. Uh, uh, and um, that's one of the reasons why this was such a very, very long inquiry, 525 days. And I can't remember how many, the, the first 70 or 80 days were taken up with arguing about the policy and the need arguments. And there's a quote from one of the ministers at the time about the white paper looking a little yellow at the edges. And, and I think what he meant by that was it wasn't, it wasn't very clear. So uh, policy support for this terminal was, was equivocal at best, you know, and, and there was a lot of argument about it. Um, and uh, I, I was with BA at the time, and uh, we, by then, were supporting this, of course we were promoting it, having opposed it back in 81, 83. That was quite a, an interesting switch. And... Um, 
we, and I, I, I don't claim any particular credit or, or anything for this, but, but the, the company decided to make this, this statement that a Terminal 5 would not lead to a third runway. We tried to be careful about the statement, but inevitably it got thought of as a promise. We don't want a third runway. Uh, and you know, that was overturned, uh, that was uh, uh, broken uh, a few years later. So, so again, you have another uh, of these arguments where, <coughs> another of these cases where a promise or a commitment or a policy gets over uh, overturned. So what else was going on then? Channel Tunnel opened, 94, and uh, oh, this chap uh, got in in 97. Um, it's interesting actually because the 97 election itself didn't didn't cause any major changes but then to be honest there wasn't, there wasn't much policy going on and it was in the middle of the T5 inquiry and that, that, that sort of spanned it by uh, a couple of years on this side so we get to the turn of the, uh, of the, of the millennium um, and the new Labour government uh, and it really was new Labour with a, with a capital N um, under John Prescott uh, sorry not, not the government but the transport department under Prescott at, at, at uh, uh, sought a, a, a complete integrated transport policy, uh, which was 1998, and he started, uh, and in that he promised a 30-year comprehensive <coughs> aviation strategy. So a whole consultation process started, the future of aviation, SERAS is the south of Eng southeast of England regional air services study, so there was another consultation there, all leading to this white paper uh, in 2003, the future of air transport which was, as it said, a 30-year national airport strategy. And it contained, uh, as far as London's concerned, contained uh, basically two proposals for new runways. A new runway, first new runway to be at Stansted in, in the timescale 2011-2012, so about uh, eight years hence, as it were, from then. And then the second new runway at Heathrow uh, to be in the timescale 2015-2020. But the... the um, Heathrow runway proposal was conditional upon meeting some very strict environmental conditions, which we'll come back to later. Um, and if those conditions couldn't be met, there was a fallback, which was another runway at Gatwick. So uh, all three appeared in, in that paper, albeit uh, it was Stansted first, Heathrow second, and then Gatwick as a fallback if Heathrow. In the meantime, uh, Heathrow Terminal 5 had been approved in... in 2001 after the inquiry and then construction took place and it opened in 2008 <coughs> and then we get towards the end of the decade and lots of studies have been done on both Gap, uh, on both Stansted and, and Heathrow and the Heathrow studies in particular this business of, of meeting the environmental conditions um, had, had been uh, finished by around 2009 and the minister then um, Jeff Hoon I think it was had uh, said that, that Heathrow could now go ahead um, but then we had another. Then we had an election, a general election in, in May 2010, and uh, both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, in their manifestos, had said that if they got in, uh, they would cancel the new runway project. And of course, they got in as a coalition, so that's exactly what they did straight away. So, so here we have a complete switch of policy from two new runways uh, approved in the in the 2000s, and then cancelled uh, as a change of uh, government. So let's bring us up to this decade. Um, so the new, the coalition uh, government's policy was better, not bigger. Uh, and then there was some sort of short, medium-term stuff that they did. South East Airport's task force, I think it was called in 2011, uh, under, um, uh, what's her name? Who knows her name? Justin, Justin Green. Green, well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, who I think is Richmond MP. And, uh, but she was Secretary of State. Putney. Sorry, Putney, okay. Putney, yeah. But underneath the Heathrow flight path, anyway. Uh, she was Secretary of State for a while, and all this sort of short-term stuff was, was under her watch. Uh, but uh, then uh, the, the government decided to uh, put the whole long-term stuff back to another commission. So we go back uh, uh, 40 years to the Airports Commission. By this time, McLaughlin had become Secretary of State. Uh, so the Airports Commission works for about three years altogether, um, and does a very extensive piece of work, lots and lots of, of uh, papers for, open for consultation, uh, some public hearings, uh, uh, lots of studies and all sorts of things like that, all published, very, very extensive <coughs> list of documents published. 
And uh, in their interim report, they came up with a view that basically you, there are three options in their shortlist, and two of those were at Heathrow, different runway configurations, and the, the third one was at Gatwick. Uh, so we go back again. Um, at, at around the same time, it was actually a few months afterwards, they produced a special report on the Thames Estuary <coughs> operations, which the mayor, of course, had been promoting, um, dismissing those, uh, but, but they did produce, a, a, I mean, they dismissed you know, about 40, 45 <coughs> options, but they did a special report on Thames Estuary. And then their final report, July 2015, just after the election when the Conservatives had won back a majority. Um, now, it then took a long time for the government to make a decision, initially because they uh, were concerned about the environmental work in, in the Airports Commission work and weren't content that it was, it was good enough, so they did some more work there. And then, of course, the whole thing got caught up with the referendum in June, uh, or sorry, last year, uh, and in, uh, in uh, that, and then a, a you know, change of government, change of, anyway, change of prime minister and minister. Um, so this chap gets appointed. And then we finally get a decision on the 25th of October uh, last year, 2016, finally get a decision. And it was, the decision was to agree with the Airports Commission recommendation that Heathrow uh, was the, the, uh, the best of the three options. Now, the next step is a national policy statement. And I was hoping that that might have been published even today. Uh, it hasn't been, unless it's been published this afternoon. But look out for it. I think it's going to be published this week. And that will take the, the next steps, as it were. So that's the timeline. So what I'd like to do now is to try and pick out these themes. Uh, and say so there, there were half a dozen of them. Uh, the first one is, is forecasts. What's happened to forecasts in all of these? And here's a few quotes. You can, you can read those yourself. <coughs> I think, I think they're quite good. They, they, they start from the sort of very general, and they, <laughs> the, one at the bottom I like particularly, the forecast is always wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, but this is, this is a, a graph uh, which just needs a little bit of explaining because this is attempting to show whether the forecasts are indeed always wrong. So the thick black line is the actual. From, uh, we're going from 1970 through to the well, current day and then forecast beyond. And these various dotted lines are various forecasts that have been made over, the over time. Most of them are fairly close to the actuals, but with two exceptions worth pointing out. The, the forecast right at the beginning here was the Roskill Commission forecast made in 1970 or thereabouts, and clearly was uh, for <laughs> continuation of, expand, uh, of growth, which didn't happen because of the recession, the oil crisis and all that stuff at the time. <laughs> and perhaps in a similar way, the forecast made in the 2003 white paper uh, assumed uh, continual growth, but that was scuppered by the, the 2008 recession, which is this dip here, which, although it recovered, obviously recovered at a, at a lower level uh, and was somewhat behind. Uh, interesting to note that these sort of purple lines here uh, are the Airports Commission's forecasts, they, upper and lower. They, in fact, they did a whole range of different types of forecasts. <coughs> and we are currently just above the upper forecast. Uh, I'm not suggesting that's the way it's going to go long term. These, these things, as you can see, fluctuate up and down. But at the moment, we are above the upper forecast of the Commission. Um, one of the interesting things about, about forecasting is... is when you forecast, are you predicting and then providing? And what I mean by that is if you predict, let's take this green line, if you predict there's going to be 300 million passengers uh, in, in 2030, and you then have a policy which provides 300 million's worth of capacity, is that going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy? It could be. And there's arguments about this in relation to road, rail, and I'm sure, you know, um, Transport for London, whether it's underground or, or bus uh, uh, patronage, will, will have similar sort of arguments. Do you, do you provide what you predict for, for what you predict? Or do you somehow manage your demand downwards by introducing some, some form of constraint? Maybe price, maybe uh, congestion, if you like. Don't, don't provide the facilities and let congestion rule. So it's always a difficult choice, a difficult thing to, to understand. I think nationally, this country has decided not to provide enough capacity for roads. That's been the, the, the policy for some years. But on railways, and I, I won't speak about underground, but certainly national rail, the policy at the moment is to provide for unconstrained demand. Uh, 
So, so there are different policies, but for, and for very valid reasons. The one, uh, the one I can point out here is that this one, which seems to be a very unconstrained demand, the policy in the 2003 white paper, which was actually for two new runways, would not have met that demand. It would have been about 10% below it. Now, it's not much. It's only 10% below, and some people would argue, well, you, should, you shouldn't provide, you know, 50% below, or you shouldn't <laughs> provide any growth at all. But nevertheless, um, it wasn't quite predict and provide, but nevertheless, it, it wasn't really management of demand either. So, theme two uh, is, is about technology. And uh, uh, two aspects to this. One is aircraft size. So, so are we going to get anything like this? <laughs> and the, the other one about aero engines. That's Frank Whittle with, with the first jet engine, I'm sure he recommends. This is a very interesting graph. This is aircraft size, or average seats per de per aircraft or per departure up this side uh, against a year. So in the 70s and, and mm -hmm. early 80s, we had a, a very rapid growth of aircraft size. And this, of course, was when 747s, DC-10s, TriStars, and Airbus A300s were being introduced, replacing aircraft half their size. So a dramatic <coughs> increase in the number of seats per aircraft, size of aircraft. But it sort of flattened, not quite flattens out, but the, the growth uh, um, slows down in, in, uh, in the mid-80s onwards. And indeed, although this, this graph only goes to 2008, I suspect that it's probably on a similar trajectory now. And uh, what, what's happening, and I, and I think I, I'm going to try and illustrate this by this. The, these are two modern aircraft, Airbus A380, Airbus A350. The A380 is about a 550-seat aircraft. Um, and the A350 is about 300 seats, something of that. So they're, they're, they're sort of comparable, more or less. No, not quite, but more or less. Now, if you're an airline and you're operating a, a long-haul service, you've got a choice. You could put um, you know, two of these a day, uh, and that would give you uh, <coughs> 1,100 seats in each direction. Um, or you could put, say, four of these a day. Well, that would give you 1,200 seats, but, but three and a half, four-ish, that sort of thing. So... Your choice is you either put a big aircraft on at a lower frequency or a slightly smaller aircraft at a, a higher frequency. This one will be cheaper, cheaper to operate in terms of its seat mile cost. I mean, take for example, you've got two pilots and you can spread their cost between 550 people. You've got two pilots in here and you spread their cost between 300. Lots of things like that. I mean, there are some things that will be cheaper to operate about. It's only got two engines because it's a start. So. But nevertheless, this one inherently will be cheaper to operate per sea mile. So why, do you put, why would you choose to put this one on? Well, the answer is you'll get more revenue with this one because it's more frequency. Um, uh, you'll get more people, in particular, in the front. And in the front is the place where you make your profit. You don't make your profit from the tourist class at the back. You make your profit from your, your premium the, uh, uh, business class and so on. So nobody knows quite why this is the case, uh, but it is. And, and, and there's, there's a couple of very interesting academic papers called The Puzzle of Aircraft Size. And nobody quite understands, well, that's not true, entirely true, but the simple fact is that smaller aircraft operated more frequently will, will generate more revenue um, than, than larger ones. And the, the relationship to airports, of course, is, is, is that this aircraft, so you're operating this twice a day, you need two runway slots. This one, same number of passengers, you need four runway slots. So clearly you can see the relationship between passengers <coughs> and, and uh, runway. And that's been the case throughout, you know, go back to the, the Roskill uh, review, the Maplin review, and even today talking about the third runway at Heathrow, it's the same issue. Technology uh, about air engines. Uh, uh, this one, <laughs> I'm not sure they were ever really as bad as that. <laughs> they may have been, who knows. That's, <laughs> that's a sort of first generation. Uh, jets and they were they were pretty noisy. They certainly were very noisy and they were pretty smoky and horrible as well. This is a Rolls Royce Trent, which is the sort of more modern thing. And uh, the way that noise is dealt with is that the the large outer fan uh, surrounds uh, the, the the air coming out from the inner fan, which is the high high speed, and that's the noisy stuff. And it's surrounded by the, the, the this lower speed stuff, and it sort of muffles the noise. But they're also, you know, much more efficient in terms of fuel use, smoke, and all those sorts of things. You know, completely different. So aero engines have changed dramatically, and that that takes us to the next theme, uh, which the first two or three things are about, basically about aero engines. 
So this theme is, is about how environmental issues are, have been dealt with over the years. First of all, noise. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that modern aircraft are much, much quieter, individually much quieter than, than the first generation or even the second generation. Uh, you know, if you, if you hear a, a 787 or a A350 these days, um, they're very much less noisy than their predecessors. And you can measure this noise in a number of ways, and, and the, the, the sort of standard way to do it is by an average, which is an average over a day, it's actually over a number of days, so you're, you're taking account of both the number of aircraft and the actual noise, the, the individual noise they make. And what you can see by doing that oh, sorry, is that um, this chart on the top left here, the outer line was, was a particular noise contour in uh, 1974, so that's in the middle of the first generation. <coughs> and that's the same noise level 2013, so today. So a dramatic reduction in this average noise level. However, not everybody agrees that that's the right way to measure it, because people say, some people say um, uh, that, that uh, the number of aircraft is, uh, is more important, if you like, than, than the actual noise they make. So um, on av in average terms, you know, 10, uh, 10 aircraft today <laughs> on average might be as noisy as one aircraft used to be. But the fact is that there are 10 of them, so they're every few minutes instead of one every you know, 30 minutes, or whatever it is, something like that. So there are uh, you know, controversies about the way you measure it. And these, char sorry, keep doing this. these charts are from the Airports Commission, one of their reports. And one of the measures they've used is, is this one here, N70, which is actually a number of aircraft. It's a number of aircraft exceeding a particular noise level. But they also produce these... Um, uh, these numbers here, which are average noise levels uh, of various different types. This chart's interesting because it shows that almost whichever measure you take, the current noise level, which is the one on the left-hand side, is more than the future noise level. And these are 2013 and 2030. <coughs> and, and, and some of these include with the third runway. So what they're saying is that under this measure, <coughs> uh, the number of people currently is 640,000, but in the future, under various different scenarios, in fact, uh, yeah, these are some Heathrow ones, uh, or, or even if you did nothing at all, just kept two, two runways, uh, the, the noise would be less. And this is the, there's a continual uh, reduction in noise as the older aircraft are retired. We're, we're beginning to see the retirement of the, of the Boeing 747s now, and they are being replaced by quieter aircraft. So that, that's happening, but of course, you know, that's still a very large number, uh, whether you take that number or that number there. Relative to other airports, it's a very, very large number. The, the similar numbers at Gatwick and Stansted are one order, if not two orders of magnitude less. So, so they're very, very significant. Uh, local air quality, um, I, I should say that noise has always been an issue, obviously, you know, from, from even from the days of propeller aircraft, but noise has always been an issue. This is one that's crept up, uh, to be honest. But I'm sure this sort of graph is fairly, uh, this sort of chart is fairly familiar. This is uh, nitrous dioxide, uh, uh, nit uh, nitrogen dioxide. So this is one of the nitrous oxides, which have suddenly, we've suddenly found are, are uh, <coughs> higher than we want them to be. And you can clearly see on this map that they're associated with roads and the centre of, of town with a little hot spot here at Heathrow. Um, and so this is obviously caused by road, primarily by road traffic. Obviously, the, the, there's a little contribution from aircraft there. Um, and the view is that it's primarily diesels. Now, whether it's diesel buses, trucks, taxis, or cars is a, a matter of some continuing debate. But nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, there is an issue there. And these are anything that's sort of uh, yellow or red. I think particular red, is exceeding <laughs> legal limits. Uh, again, there's arguments about precisely what those are, but uh, uh, you know, all governments have pledged to, to get these lower than the legal limits, and they're not at the moment. <coughs> uh, and, and Heathrow's part of that. So that's an issue which has sort of crept up in the, in the last um, uh, few years. Another issue which wasn't apparent in the 70s, but became apparent through the 90s, and in particular in the 2003 white paper, was aviation's contribution <coughs> to climate change. <coughs> it makes a contribution, it's a fairly small percentage, 
but if you do nothing about it, it will grow. And as all the other uh, sectors decarbonize, you know, uh, power generation decarbonizes, uh, and probably other transport, uh, this becomes a, a, an important part. So this is the aviation industry's roadmap. <coughs> and they reckon that, that uh, there's quite a lot of technology that can still come into play. There's a bit of biofuel here. And then the rest is carbon trading. And that's controversial. Uh, that means buying, buying carbon permits from other sectors. Yeah, but that's, that's the, the map they propose. Just a few other environmental issues that come up from time to time. Um, agriculture was important uh, in, in the 1940s when Heathrow was taken. Uh, I think that's a market or a, an orchard in Colnbrook. And it's, it's, many of you know Colnbrook is where the, the Cox's Orange Pippin was first bred. Uh, and, and it was important at Stansted, a lot of good quality agricultural land up there. But not at Maplin, uh, not or, or the Thames Estuary, <coughs> but there are birds at, uh, uh, in the Thames Estuary. Yeah. And that's effectively the reason why, certainly why the latest proposals have been rejected. You take on the RSPB at your peril. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, there was something, uh, there was a consultation uh, where there were half a million responses. A quarter of a million of them were from RS, RSPB. Unbelievable how they managed to, to get that, that uh, together. But, but that's a, clearly a very significant issue. Heritage issues, listed buildings. This is Little Cooper's Cottage, which we relocated from Stansted, uh, a grade two. Uh, oh, no, it's, that's now at a, uh, one of these sort of country parks. But some had to be demolished. And there are, there are uh, listed buildings at Heathrow, just north of the uh, third runway, which I don't think have to be demolished, but they're certainly at risk. They'll be very close. So that's the sort of issue. Flooding, um, that's Gatwick. <laughs> Occasionally gets flooded by the River Mole. And uh, this is Stansted. Um, and Stansted is on a high, highish point around the countryside, so visual impact's important. We spent a lot of time at the quarry driving around in a minibus with a pair of binoculars looking to see if we could see. Well, this wasn't built then, of course, but, you can see. but this, this terminal is, is relatively low rise. It's only 12, only 12 metres high. Compare it to Heathrow, Terminal 5 is something like 40 metres high. Now, you know, visual impact's perhaps not quite so important at Heathrow, some might argue it is, but certainly at Stansted in, in the countryside, this is all deliberately kept uh, low rise. And that, that becomes important occasionally. Uh, theme four. Well, I mentioned about promises once or twice. So here's a few promises uh, that have been broken. <laughs> uh, uh, policies and, and promises, various, various policies not to build uh, more than uh, you know, certain <coughs> terminals. There was a limit on the number of aircraft movements. And then there are changes and cancellations, and then you find that they get they get changed again at a, a later date. Uh, Gatwick, similar things, but I will uh, I will uh, I mentioned this before, but I will point out this agreement in 1979, <coughs> which was signed between BAA and the West Sussex County Council. So no government involvement, um, and it hasn't stopped the second runway being thought about, being considered, and even even uh, reaching the shortlist of the Airports Commission. But it hasn't actually happened. And in my view, I think that is significant. If you have a legal agreement um, between two parties, they can't break it, or if they do, uh, one party can sue the other. So, so my... my con uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned about Stansted. Similar promises at Stansted. My conclusion from all of this is that uh, government policy is not worth... Uh, it's not worth paper written on. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that's not a cynical view. It is simply that no government will be bound by the policies of its predecessor. It just, you know, enacts an act of parliament. But a legal agreement is different because you can sue the other party. And that compensation might be very, uh, very important. And I think that's an important conclusion. And, and, and who knows, that might play a part of the, in the uh, current debate. Uh, airlines. Um, <coughs> we often forget that airports don't exist on their own and, and the can't be successful on their own. They can only be successful if airlines want to fly there. Want to, want, and, and they can only be uh, successful if passengers want to fly there. So airlines at Heathrow. Well, of course, we've had uh, the nationalised airlines, the OACVEA, uh, then becoming British Airways, and then becoming privatised. And they've always had a, 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 a favoured place at Heathrow. Government policy very clearly in the, in the 40s and 50s was to promote these airlines. Um, and other airlines that he throw, like British Eagle and British Midland, independent airlines, have struggled and never been able to, to, to uh, make their mark there. Uh, so that's been an important factor. 
But we mustn't forget uh, foreign airlines as well. Uh, Pan Am bought the first 747 into Heathrow. Uh, and go back to the point about large aircraft. Um, uh, some uh, airlines have got very deep pockets. This is Oman Air. You may not have heard of them. Um, but they paid $75 million for a pair of slots at Heathrow recently. $75 million. It's an astonishing amount for not, uh, no physical asset or anything like that. This is for the right to, to run two services in and out of Heathrow. Um, and they didn't buy them from the airport. They bought them from Cyprus Airways. Cyprus Airways happened to have these slots, for <laughs> historical reasons, and were going bust. And then they were saved by, by buying these slots. Cyprus Airways moved to Stansted and thought that was okay. So that's a, a very relevant thing about airlines. Uh, alliances, uh, Sky Team is Air France, KLM, uh, and one or two others, and they're trying to consolidate in one terminal, Terminal 4 at Heathrow. Likewise, um, uh, um, Star Alliance, which is uh, Singapore, Lufthansa, um, United, one or two others, I can't remember, um, are in terminal two, the new Terminal 2 at Heathrow. British Airways, One World, they're primarily in Terminal 5, but they, they, they can't all fit in there, so some of their services are in the other terminals as well. But they, they're, what they're trying to do is to, is to get uh, all, all, all their services in the same terminal, so their passengers can transfer between flights easily. Uh, Gatwick Airlines, well Gatwick started of course as a, an, airline, uh, an airport for charter flights, so, so we do get lots of independent airlines there. Good old Dan Air used to be there, and indeed still today you have... Um, uh, a few, not many charter services, but a few, uh, certainly leisure services. <coughs> uh, it was the home at a time, uh, for a time, for British Caledonia, which was uh, designated as Britain's second force airline, so very clear government policy, uh, giving it uh, long distance routes and so on. Sadly, they didn't survive either. Um, and now, um, it, it, the largest airline there is, is EasyJet, um, larger than British Airways. Um, uh, so a low-cost airline. So it, doesn't, it wasn't quite what it was built for in the first place, but there you are. Did, did things change? <coughs> and Stansted, well, uh, before it was built, uh, before, sorry, before it was really developed, uh, there was a, a thriving trade in Scandinavian shopping charters. They all used to come over and, and go shopping and then go back the same day. Uh, then when the, the, the new terminal was built, it was a sort of experimental <coughs> place for low-cost airlines. Go was a British Airways subsidiary. Um, and of course, that's now turned into Ryanair as, as 70 or 80 percent of flights from, from Stansted are Ryanair, so they've really done very well there. Some experiments with long haul American ran a service to Chicago for a short while, not successful, didn't, didn't survive. Uh, they keep trying, and, and maybe they'll get one one day. I haven't mentioned Luton very much uh, um, in, in this, but, but it's worth just picking out a few things about Luton. Um, do you remember Court Line? <laughs> pastel pink and yellow. And <laughs> the point about them is these are big aircraft. This is a TriStar, so 350 seats going to Mallorca or, or Spain or something like that. And um, none of that happens these days. It's all A320s and 737s to, to, to those sort of parts, half the size. They were trying to do this business of you know, getting more passengers on, lower seat mile costs, and they did it for a while, but went bust. <laughs> um, but now, of course, EasyJet is, is, is based at Luton, although it's not, it's not EasyJet's biggest uh, base, because that's at Gatwick. But nevertheless, they've grown up there. Some experiments uh, with um, business class only long haul, uh, you know, something like 50, 50 seats on this aircraft, business class, um, hasn't really worked, two or three attempts have, have failed. And, and one of the most surprising things about Luton, it's actually London's <coughs> largest Business aviation airport. And business aviation, I mean corporate jets and this sort of thing. If you ever have a look at the Google Maps image of, of, of Luton, there's loads of these things lying all over the place. Um, uh, and it is actually, in terms of movements, it's the largest uh, business aviation airport for London. Somewhat surprising, but, but it seems to work well. People seem to like it. So, last, my last theme, surface access, I, I'll tell you the best to last. And I thought you'd love this picture. <laughs> But first of all, to go back to that picture of Gatwick in the 30s, and uh, the point being here that, that at, even at the time in the 30s, it had its own rail station, which was connected by an underground passageway into this, this uh, very fancy terminal. So very much an integrated uh, terminal. And then the 140. Um, this is a particular favourite of mine because my dad used to work at Heathrow. We lived in Harrow, and he caught this bus every day to work uh, while he was working there. So uh, a particular favourite, I remember that one well. 
Um, so just, just running through surface access, well, if you remember, uh, uh, before the Piccadilly line, uh, the way that public transport used to operate to Heathrow from central London was via these air terminals, West London, uh, that's now the big Sainsbury's uh, you know, over uh, despite it was a triangle around Mills Court way, uh, and dedicated buses which were allocated to each flight. So you would, you would check in here, your baggage will be put in, a, in, in the back of this bus, and uh, you know, you're about to know this, what's, what's the number of those buses? What, what's the code name for them? Four. Four. Well, I knew somebody would know. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was in, in, in the uh, parade, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's great. Anyway, uh, that's the way it used to work, and there was a similar thing for VOHC from, from Victoria. Uh, Victoria. And then in, in 77, the uh, uh, Piccadilly line got to Heathrow, and this effectively stopped virtually overnight, uh, because that's the way people then got to, to the airport. But in the 78 uh, white paper, uh, well, the, the Piccadilly line for Heathrow was noted. The M25 was beginning to be completed. It wasn't, wasn't quite completed by then, but it was being built. And so was the M11. Later in that decade, uh, you, you find the, the uh, looking at the longer term, so the various plans for different airports all had their road and rail spurs. And, and Stansted was, frankly, one of the easiest ones <coughs> to deal with. The, 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 the new road and rail access would have been easiest. The initial plan for Stansted, by the way, was for that service to go to St Pancras. Eventually, as you know, it goes to Liverpool Street, but that was the initial plan. Um, and so we get to the, the, the late 70s, and, and we've got the Piccadilly line confirmed, and, and Stansted and so on. Um, in the 1980s, uh, surface access was fairly important <coughs> at the 81 83 airports inquiries, but not, I wouldn't say it was a, a, um, you know, a stopper. It wasn't, it, it wasn't one of those sort of things. And indeed, likewise, in, in the 85 white paper. Um, except that I would point out again, just repeat, that that was the point at which the studies began, which eventually became Heathrow Express. So Terminal 4 opened with its loop, uh, the line. And here, here's an interesting <coughs> difference between Heathrow's new terminal was served by uh, a loop, an extension, of, uh, you know, full rail extension, but Gatwick, uh, Instead of, instead of building some sort of loop or spur or a diversion of the railway line, they put in a people mover, which is still there today. Now, you might say, well, that's obvious. You know, you can't move, you can't move a mainline railway, uh, quite rightly so. But it is interesting that there are different solutions. You don't, when you expand, when you, you know, we could have put a people mover into Terminal 4. And to some extent, that sort of partly happens today because either the Piccadilly line or Heathrow Express don't operate a full service to Team 4, they only operate you know, every, whatever it is, 1 in 3. And Heathrow Express is, is, a, is a sort of shuttle arrangement. So there are interesting differences <coughs> between the way in which rail access gets to Heathrow and, and to, to Gatwick. And one final point, which is, you might say, what's this got to do with service access, because it's a helicopter, uh, but that used to operate between Heathrow and Gatwick something like 11 times a day. Um, in an attempt to make the two airports sort of work together. It's an airside link so you could check your baggage through. And that ended when the M25 was completed in, or at least that, that part, in 1986, I think. So that's another event. Uh, uh, surface access in the 1990s. Rukatsi didn't really say anything about surface access. We'll pass over that. Heathrow Express got through its parliamentary stages and then we built it. There was a little minor difficulty when... It fell down, but uh, <laughs> we got it operating uh, 97 initially and then 98 full operation. So that's, that's been, uh, it was there today, of course, and it worked very well. But the Terminal 5 inquiry, surface access was a big issue, so it's now becoming really big, really, really important. And the issues there were about the M25. Did it need to be widened? How would you create access? And you all know the, the road that you've got there now. Uh, both the Piccadilly line and Heathrow Express were extended, and that was part of the application. <coughs> and one important point about Heathrow Express is that if you know, uh, if you know Heathrow Terminal 5, you've got um, the two Piccadilly line platforms to the north, two Heathrow Express platforms, and then next to the Heathrow Express platforms is a box, a, a large box, which is the same size as those two Heathrow Express platforms, ready and waiting for platforms three and four. That's a complete uh, a vacant box that was built. It's a condition of the inquiry, but that was put in. Um, and uh, 
and a, uh, a limit on car parking, total car parking, public and, and staff, 42,000. So that, that's, that's to help cap that. And one other thing just worth mentioning uh, in this decade, the London Airport Surface Access Study, LASAS, uh, looks at a whole range of, of additional services, uh, one of which was called Sister Hex, which was originally going to be a service from Heathrow to St Pancras, but came in, in a sort of shortened form as, as the what is now Heathrow Connect, and will eventually be taken over by Crossrail. The gateway stations, this is Felton. This, this the proposed at Felton and, and Hayes, and the idea you'd have a dedicated bus service between these stations to connect, uh, a bit like the, the, uh, the Reading Road and Woking Rail there, but at a, a, a shorter distance. Um, this, um, they didn't work, unfortunately. Uh, this was built by uh, Rail Track, I think it was at the time. Uh, London Buses did a very good job with some dedicated buses for a while. The local authority, Hounslow, put some bus lanes in. EBAA uh, put in a million pounds to help it. Uh, but it didn't work. It was probably let down by Southwest Trains, who, who did nothing at all. Um, and, and we never got as far as doing one for Hayes. But, but that was sort of taken over by uh, um, Heathrow Connect. And then lastly, Air Track, which is a sudden link, a, a full sudden link, um, which tried to get going but never quite managed it uh, in this sort of period um, for, for all sorts of reasons, operational reasons mainly. In the 2000s, the white paper, remember the white paper had two main proposals, New Runway at Stansted and New Runway at Heathrow. At Stansted, um, the, the basic proposal was to try and get more capacity on the Lee Valley line. And if you know the Lee Valley line, um, I can't remember which station this is, but, but there is space Okay, there is space for additional tracks. And the proposal at the time was a, a third um, tidal flow uh, track. Um, the other problem there is, is you've got quite a lot of level crossings, which are just about okay with two tracks. But if you started putting three or even four, you know, that's quite difficult with a level crossing. Uh, so that was the issue there. Oh, and the M11 would have had to be widened from three to four lanes. There was an issue, by the way, about, about this is the first time the issue of who pays came up, really. And the policy is that the airport pays to the extent that it benefits. Uh, but <laughs> that's open to quite a lot of argument, you know. Uh, and, and actually, it's interesting, with the, with the three, uh, the M11 widening, there was a tentative deal done, which was that because the airport amounted to 17% of traffic on the M11, then the airport would pay for 70% of the widening. And I'm not quite sure <coughs> it's entirely logical, but that was the deal done at the time. Uh, the Heathrow studies, um, by then Heathrow uh, Express and uh, extension and, and Piccadilly Line extension <coughs> had been open. Um, and there were a number of studies done, and air track came back, but it didn't really get very far. So, uh, 2010s, uh, coming to the end here. Um, so 2010s, uh, as we said, the Airports Commission started looking at this again. And as far as Heathrow is concerned, it, it, you're beginning to see quite a lot, quite a difference here, because Piccadilly Line upgrades beginning to be on the agenda. Um, Crossrail, of course, is, is under construction, and uh, uh, we're all interested to see what happened to that. Western Rail access to Heathrow, that sort of suddenly appeared. It, it was studied around for a while, but it was always thought to be second best to air track or suddenly but it's been promoted as it were and now seems to be uh, the favored uh, additional scheme this is this is uh, to uh, slough maidenhead and, and reading hs2 of course uh, is coming um well probably uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and uh, whether uh, quite how the link will work between old oak common and heathrow i'm not sure but it's, it's coming southern links being studied but but doesn't look too hopeful to be honest um, but the point about staff travel here, uh, this graph relates to this. This is, Heathrow have said, with a third runway, there will be no additional airport-related traffic on the roads. How do they, how do they say that? <coughs> well, first of all, they ex expect passenger-related road traffic to rise, whether they're, uh, you know, kiss and fly, park and fly, or taxi, <coughs> that will rise. But employee-related road traffic will halve, basically. So that when you add them all up, they're, they're about the same. Now, uh, <laughs> that's quite ambitious, <laughs> and um, we'll see. Um, I mean, they've done a tremendous job already uh, in terms of uh, getting more staff on the public transport and just 
car sharing and so on. And of course, the numbers, you know, compared to central London, the number of employees who drive uh, in central London is, is, is tiny compared to, to even the throws. But um, that's the ambition and that's the, that's the, the plan. Um, the other, the other uh, options in, in the Airports Commission, there was, there was a, a Heathrow hub option which involved uh, a new station on the Great Western Main Line and a people mover. Um, and frankly, didn't get very far. It wasn't, it, uh, it wasn't very popular, didn't get much support. Uh, the, the plan for Gatwick relied on the Brighton Main Line. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we didn't, even when this was being discussed two or three years ago, I don't think many people thought that was going to be sufficient. And more recent events have shown that it's clearly not. Um, Stansted, well, I think by that time, uh, they were talking about four tracking, I believe, about it. And the Thames Estuary, this is one of, one of TfL's charts. Um, I have to say that TfL <coughs> did a fantastic job um, uh, in analysing and proposing both the Thames Estuary schemes and Stansted, they treated them equally, they were just in, as much in favour of Stansted as, as Thames Estuary, in terms of, as you would expect in terms of road and rail access, so it did some very good work. Um, the Airports Commission did not accept either of, their, uh, either of those proposals, not for road access or access reasons, but for other reasons. And so we get to the government announcement. So that, that's more or less it, I, I, I said I <coughs> end on, on the theme um, of, of uh, uh, service access. <coughs> And I was hoping that we, we might have this, and, and as you can see, uh, we haven't actually got one, so I, I made one up myself. Uh, but this is what I would expect to be uh, uh, published, may, maybe tomorrow, maybe this week, who, who knows, it's difficult to say with, with the Brexit bill going through, what, what's, uh, what's occupying the government's mind at the moment, probably not this. But, but I think something like this will come, and I'm not sure what it's going to say, whether it's going to say some of the things I've said about... Uh, air quality, noise, pollution, whether it's just about Heathrow, whether it covers other airports. It's all a little unclear at the moment, um, but we'll find out soon enough anyway. Um, most of my, my research, of course, has been looking at the past. I, I'm not really looking to the future yet, but of course the whole point about history is, is that you learn from it, hopefully, <laughs> uh, and apply the lessons to the future. So thanks very much. Thank you. Happy to Thank you. Very comprehensive material there for you to get your teeth into, ladies and gentlemen. So, who's got some questions? We'll go there first, then we'll come to the front. Yeah. You haven't mentioned City Airport, which of course has been thriving recently and had its own railway link with the DLR. Can you say a bit more about City and where um, it Yes, I, I mean, apart from the, from the photograph of the first flight, so, so that shows it's fairly yeah. recent. and. Um, in fact, for, for its first few years, it, it didn't look as if it was going to do very much. It, it, it numbers kept down, but you're quite right. Recently, I think I'm up to about 4 million passengers now, which, which is, I mean, it's small compared to Heath Heathrow's 76 million, Gatwick's 42, Stansted's 24. So, you know, a uh, city of 4 million is still quite small, less than Luton. But nevertheless, important, obviously important to London. Uh, and the DLR uh, uh, vies with Copenhagen as the rail link with the highest proportion of uh, use by air passengers. It's something around 50%. Copenhagen reckons they get 55%. Yeah, you'll also see some figures from the Far East that claim 60%, but don't believe that. <laughs> but, but certainly in Europe, it vies, so, so it's very <coughs> successful, the, the, the DR link, very, very good. But small numbers of passengers. Okay, we'll go to Joel, I'll give you the mic, because you're within reach. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I speak as a former BOAC inmate, and I've always taken an interest in the idea of some time ago. Three quick points. I have at home the BOAC management brief on MacBook, if you like, I can make a PDF of it for you. Great. And the, the BOAC was violently against MacBook on the grounds of who would pay for the movie. And whilst BOAC was nationalised, people like Pan American <coughs> weren't, and they exercised the leverage, which basically killed it. It wasn't so much government policy as the airline's reluctance to move. <laughs> BOAC had about, about 100 million invested in Heathrow at the time. Second point is you talked about the relative size of aircraft. Now, when we brought in the 747 in 1970, I was actually working on ground staff then, the one thing we thought we were going to take was take off every two and a half planes, couldn't narrow body for a 747. 
and we ended up doing one for one as all the other airlines did because it's the connections that count, <coughs> not the point to point. 35% of our passengers were connecting passengers and consolidating the flights, especially the long haul flights, meant we lost our connecting traffic to rival airlines. And the third point, briefly, uh, is about the national policy that goes on from here. We've got three major airports, Heathrow, Gatwick and Stansted. They're all privately owned by large corporations pouring billions into them. The other two are not going to sit down and lay back when Heathrow gets its third airport. I've been to some London First meetings about it, and the definite viewpoint of the other two airports is they are not very happy that they're being sidelined. Yeah. Stansted, to my mind, as a former airport and airline worker, is the logical extension. But given the way uh, food is going, we need all the agricultural land we can get at the moment. <laughs> so, so what are your views on sort of the connectivity of planes okay. and yeah. all well, sort of airports? I, I mean, you're right. To, uh, I did say that uh, airports can't do anything out there, airlines. And you're quite right to, to raise the whole question of airlines and how they, how they work. <coughs> and those debates still go on. You, you've probably heard Willie Wall say he's not going to pay for a third run where he throw. He always uh, does. Uh, <laughs> so that debate goes on, yes, we will see that. And you're quite right, transfer traffic is, is very important um, uh, because it enables you to fill up an aeroplane uh, which would otherwise be, be half empty and therefore operate at a better frequency. And, and the point you make about replacing one for one is simply that the growth was so rapid that, that you could do that. Um, uh, I'm not sure the growth is, is quite that sort of level now, which may be one of the reasons why the A380 is not doing quite as well as the 747 did. Uh, so, so you, you're absolutely right in all of that. And, and in, sorry, your third point was um, was really just I've got the management brief on that. Oh, yeah, sure, yes, you, okay, yes. If you'd like a copy, of my, it, <laughs> my first job when I joined BAA was, was on was on that. And uh, one thing I can always remember about it was that we had a map on the wall of the well, that map there I think I showed you, and superimposed was the circle line. And the circle line was the same size. <laughs> <laughs> okay, was the one up here? I saw it. Yes. Um, Following 9-11, was a security ever a consideration in the location of airports and flight paths over central London? Uh, I'm sure it was, but, but not, not that it ever came out in uh, really as a... I mean, Heathrow was there, and, and uh, every time you ask a question about are the, are the flight paths over London safe, the answer is yes. Uh, not argue about that, but, but the, 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 if you look at the statistical evidence from around the world about where aircraft crash and so on, um, whether deliberately or, or accidentally, um, it, it, it's considered to be acceptable. Yeah. We don't, there are accidents, of course. Uh, we all know the one at Staines at Heathrow, which was fortunately in a, a non-built up area. Mm. But there have been plenty of others. And, 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 and so I think, I think the answer is it was considered, but I don't I think it's fair to say that I'm not, I don't think it's ever really, it's not been a critical factor. Well, and whether that's for terrorism or, or sort of deliberate or, or accidental. And, yeah. Okay. One right at the back. Uh, what do you think you have any thoughts about Birmingham? Um, it has been suggested that it could be a, another London airport once the HS2 is running because it's really trying to disrupt the team south end or central. Well, as you saw, it was about Birmingham. I'm conscious there are, there are, there are, there's audience beyond this room, okay. so I should say the question's about Birmingham. Okay, of course. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, that, that raises the whole regional issue, which, as you saw, uh, came up every time, right from the, 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 the 70s onwards, every time it keeps coming up. Birmingham is in a particularly interesting position because, of course, it's effectively the closest to the southeast and therefore has the most opportunity. And as you say, with HS2, could be within 30 odd, odd minutes. Um, uh, and th they've done very well recently. They, they've recently um, extended their runway so they can now get more long haul services and they're growing, you know, 10, 20% a year at the moment. They've, they've just breached the 10 million mark. Uh, 10 million, <coughs> remember, Heathrow 76 million, uh, Gap 42 million, Stansted 24 million. <laughs> so, you know, everything, everything's comparison like that. I think that the HS2 gives them a fantastic opportunity I bring out back another point, uh, which is the people mover. Look where the HS2 station is compared to the airport and the National Exhibition Centre. It's a long way, and you've got to get that people mover right to make that connection. Otherwise, people are not going to do it. 
and, and I mean, the other thing about, about HS2, of course, <coughs> is with, with phase two, you'll be as close, uh, you know, Birmingham will be as close to Manchester. So Birmingham will have to be competing with Manchester as well as with, with Heathrow. But fine, you know, let them compete uh, and it'll, it'll bring standards up and they'll, uh, they'll no doubt do a good job. And in the interim, in the sort of 10 years before Heathrow's uh, third runway, there's clearly a shortfall of capacity and more demand and they should be able to pick up some more there. Okay. Yeah, um, hello. Thank you for the talk. I'm very concerned about the price level of Heathrow Express. Uh, it's really meant, it seems to me, to be designed for the business traveller. Uh, it is a tremendous difference in price between London transport fares and and you end up in the middle of Paddington, in the middle of nowhere, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think of Heathrow Express? Um, as I was, as I was the project manager and the promoter, <laughs> you can imagine. Uh, two or three things. First of all, it, it was built at a time uh, when the railway, the national railway, well, all railways were in the public sector, and could not do it. Could not do it. Literally, could not do it. They had no way of doing it. So it was built by the private sector, and if the private sector builds something, it wants a return. It won't. It won't and there was no subsidy available, so it wants to return. So that it was only built because you had a, a premium fare. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, you know there are premium fares for all sorts of things. You know you can buy a, a premium car, you could buy uh, a business class on, on an airline, which will cost you two, three, four times. The, 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 so what's the difference? You've got a choice. Thank goodness for, for London Underground, Piccadilly Line. You can choose to use that if you want, and and more people choose the Piccadilly Line to Heathrow. Than Heathrow Express, quite right. The, 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 I, I'm, not a very, I, I'm a great believer in um, uh, what, what's the word? Segment, market segmentation. Uh, <coughs> there used to be one size of Mars bar. There was one size of Mars bar, it was about that long. Uh, and then Mars bar, uh, Mars introduced loads of others, the minis, uh, mm. you know, giant ones, little, little balls and things like that. And what do they do? Increase the sales. Because there's always a segment for a different type of product. And it's the same with Heathrow Express. Heathrow Express appeals to the uh, time poor, money rich people. Piccadilly Line uh, appeals to the other end of the market, and, and that's quite right. And you don't. The last thing you want is is uh, one size fits all. One of the interesting things about Crossrail that intrigues me is that that is, I won't say in the middle because it's probably the, probably the less expensive end of the market. It'll be more expensive than Piccadilly Line, but, but quite a lot cheaper than Heathrow Express. And what effect is that going to have on the on the individual market shares, but almost more importantly, on the total market share. <coughs> What's it going to do? I don't know. I don't know. We're all intrigued to find out. So I'm afraid I, I can't agree with you. No, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant product which wouldn't be there unless there was a premium fare, and the premium fare does appeal. But when, when we were setting the fares, or at least setting the, the specification, John Egan was our chief executive, and he said you should have first class. And we said, well, it's all first class. He said, no, no. He said, first class, double the fare. So you know, 40 quid or whatever it was. And, and we said, well, who on earth is going to want that? And he said, people who don't want to be in standard class. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Anybody else? Right. Two, uh, I'll go to John and then the two gentlemen in front of John Carr. <laughs> Thanks for the splendid presentation. Um, I think it's true to say that certainly in the last days of airports had got their act together in terms of demand management that encouraged people, both staff and passengers, uh, to get to the airports by um, public transport. To what extent was that policy successful in that I believe the airports have to some extent their own planning authorities and can manage on their own expenses for land ownership? what the uses are. And the second point really is to say how much of those policies diverged since the breakup and in particular with the ownership by Manchester of Stansted. There's a lot of points in there, John. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we, the airports are, they have uh, <coughs> GDO powers and the planning act, so they can do operational uh, activities without planning permission. Um, 
But unfortunately for the Air Force, they don't, they can't build runways without planning permission, <laughs> hence, or, or indeed terminals, hence these mega inquiries, which are all done under the planning uh, legislation. Um, uh, yes, I think airports, uh, uh, and, and uh, I, I believe there's some, I'm not quite sure the legal position about highways, for example, so they, they might be their own highways um, uh, authority, um, and, and that, that can help with certain things. Um, as far as uh, getting the mode share, you know, more sustainable, more public transport, more car sharing, less <coughs> single occupancy car, yes, quite a lot's been done. Um, but funny enough, we were debating this only this afternoon with, 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 uh, with colleagues, and, and uh, I, I said to uh, some British Airways people, I said, would you, um, would you lose staff if you made them pay for their car parking? And the answer was, yes, we, we won't do it. <laughs> so you've got to be very careful about how you do this, how you, you know, it's carrots and sticks, as with all these things. You've got to provide some good carrots, some better uh, opportunities. Uh, and you've got to provide some sticks, but you've got to be careful with the sticks, because, because once you start, uh, you know, should we, uh, I mean, should we have a congestion, uh, you know, a, 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 a central air congestion charge, or a congestion charge for Heathrow? Uh, £10, same in central London. Should you do that? Uh, uh, what about if you're going to pick up, you know, your, your granny from, from the airport? Are you going to have to pay whatever it is, £10, £20 or something? Should you do that? Always a very difficult thing. I mean, same issues in London, of course, but, but uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure the breakup has made a, a huge difference in those sorts of policies. Um, I, I see all three airports continuing to, to drive. It, you know, there's some slight differences in, in emphasis. Um, and I'm not sure... <laughs> the interesting thing about Stansted, and, and, and colleagues involved in the bus industry will know this, Stansted has one of the highest public transport mode shares, uh, again, in excess of 50%, but it's entirely due to the success of the buses uh, and the rail service the Stansted has declined in quality, declined in, in, in ridership and, and is generally very awful, frankly. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, it should be doing much better, but it's opened the way for the bus services to provide a really good service, you know, 24 hours a day, range of, again, a range of, you know, hitting different market segments, different prices, different locations, done a really good job. So that, that's the difference between Stansted and the other airports at the moment. Who knows, if you get four tracks up the Lee Valley and, and uh, you manage to get uh, the Stansted Express to 35 minutes instead of 49 or whatever it is now, uh, maybe maybe that trend will reverse. Okay, question in the row front. John, yep. Um, where did the, the London South End Airport, which seems to be fairly successful now, and Kent International, which hasn't okay. been a success at all, fall into the whole plan? Well, uh, 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 I was a consultant for a while, and I worked for South End, which is the reason why it's successful. And I, didn't <laughs> <laughs> I didn't work for, for Manston, which is the reason why it wasn't successful. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very interesting, actually. The, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say South End has been successful. Um, they got up to about a million passengers a year. Again, remember the numbers. Uh, Heathrow 76, Gatwick 40, etc., etc. South End 1 million. They got up to 1 million a couple of years ago, and then they dropped again. So they haven't been able to sustain their growth. As far as surface access is concerned, um, Stobart, who, who own it, uh, who've got lots of spare cash and they don't know what to do with it, um, they, they, bought a uh, they built a railway station. It cost a fortune, 15, 16 million pounds to build that railway station at South End, if you know. There's not much to it. Uh, most of the costs, network rail, you know, uh, disruption costs. We're allowed to flag off network rail here, are we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so uh, it, it, it's actually been successful in terms of rail share. Yes, you get a good 25% of, of passengers using the railway, <coughs> which is pretty good. The airport itself hasn't, hasn't managed to, to, to get the number of passengers up as much as it could. Uh, I, I, uh, um, Manston is just too far from London. It's 70 miles from London. You know, and that's however you do it, even on a high-speed train, you're still an hour and 20 minutes away. And it's just too far. So it, it, it's never going to succeed. And there's nothing, you know, to be fair, there's not, not much of a local market. Uh, there is a bit of a local market in South End, uh, quite a decent local market. It's a decent sized town. Right, one last question somewhere? I thought I saw a hand. One in the middle there. Right, okay. I'll squeeze the other one in as well. So just these two. This one first, and then that. Yeah, I mean, my name's Richard, though. I just, just joined the, the, the museum last year ago. 
Basically, if you read this talk about the, 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 the Dotland Dot Railway um, back in 2009, and I went out the day with my girlfriend, and we, we decided to, to, to get back on the dinner back to Pawnee Castle. And the only and the only the only thing that I was completely surprised, I mean, as we come out from the Woolwich Arsenal station, the guy was standing there and it was Morris Johnson. <laughs> and he was the he was the person that who opened it to the Woolwich Arsenal yeah, station <laughs> and we was the, the first people to be on it on, on the first yeah. the first time. Do you know anyone know the, the first original DNR back in nineteen eighty seven, anyone? Yeah, memory baby. Yes. yes. And they used to go to the Fernandes and Gardens to yeah. the Tower Gateway to Stratford. We had, a, we had a talk from someone last year, Stephen Jolly, who was recalling his early days with the DLR. So if you weren't a friend then, have a word with Susan outside and we'll probably manage to get you a copy of the magazine that had all um, Stephen's recollections in it, which you might find yeah, interesting, including his passport to Docklands. Really? Yeah. I, mean, I appreciate DLR didn't get to the airport until much more recently, but it's, but it's been very successful and done very well. Right, one last question over here, and then we'll move outside. Yes, sir. Merger, you've mentioned two words, segmentation mm -hmm. and connectivity, and they don't actually work with airports. The best airports on this planet, in my opinion, are the four runway airports, such as Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, obviously, Dubai, Amsterdam, Charles de Gaulle, etc. Is there no hope for getting a four runway airport <laughs> in this country? The only places that could possibly be done in the London area is probably Stansted. Otherwise, you go back to the failed scheme at Covington, somewhere in the Wilson Keynes area, which could be adjacent to this wretched HS2 railway if we have to have it. Um, and it would actually fit the railway of purpose and serve both London and the Midlands. I, I suspect there's a few uh, agendas. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me correct you. Hong Kong is a two runway airport at the moment. They are building a third, but it's only two at the moment. Yeah. Dubai is only two runways, uh, and they're close parallels, but they are building another another airport just up the road from the Dubai world, et cetera. So they're both expanding. Uh, Amsterdam's got five. I can't remember the other one you mentioned. But Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle's got four. You're quite right. We've got five. Um, so, so, um, but the issue is, and that's exactly the argument <coughs> in favour of a third runway at Heathrow, that you need enough capacity to, to make your, your hubbing work. And hubbing works by a, a wave of aircraft coming in, people transferring, and a wave of aircraft going out. That doesn't happen at Heathrow at the moment, they're just all day. But if you look at places like Atlanta or, or Dallas, uh, they do work very much on these hubs uh, in, and out, in and out. But they've got, you know, they've got six runways each or something. No, we're never going to have four runways, I, I don't think. Not in my lifetime. No, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, there's always balance involved. And the balance means that you have to protect people on the ground from noise, road traffic, etc., etc., and you know, go back to the forecast, you have to manage demand somehow. I don't think you can allow it. So, no, I don't see uh, ever uh, anything more than three runways at Heathrow. <laughs> well, we said that before. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll draw a call to the formal proceedings there. Um, before I say thank you to Paul, a reminder that um, call with the usual drinks and nibbles outside, please give generously to cover the cost of those if you if you partake, but we'll carry on a little bit of the discussion outside. Um, I'm not going to attempt to sum up, but I am reminded of a talk I attended many, many years ago. It must have been in the 1970s by Sir Peter Maysfield, um, a man of great um, stature in both the personal sense and the professional sense. And he was talking, and I forget exactly where on your time scale his talk would have come, but he was chairman of the BAA at the time, and I think it was just after probably one of the Macklin plans that gone adrift. And somebody said right at the very end, I asked Sir Peter, well, all very interesting Sir Peter, but you've not really told us what is going to happen. Where is the new London Airport going to be? He just put on one of his very serious faces and said, I really don't know, but I expect it will all come out in the wash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and maybe it will, but probably not. Um, but our thanks to Paul for a very comprehensive, very thoughtful, very interesting presentation on a topical subject, as topical even possibly as a, as a paper this week. Uh, thank you, Paul, very much for that. Uh, a very good evening, and I think that the, the interest that's been sparked in the questions shows you just how much it's been appreciated. So, could I ask you, please, ladies and gentlemen, to <laughs>